So first of all, I'd like to start by thanking everyone for joining today and for being on our webinar regarding cognitive behavioral therapy for clinical high risk of psychosis. I'm very excited about today's webinar because we have some exceptional speakers and we're going to be talking about a topic that's really close to my heart. So um, as ever, uh, thanks to SAMHSA for their support and NTAC in pulling together these materials and this webinar and for allowing us to do this on a monthly basis. And in terms of our learning objectives today, we don't have very long, so it's really going to be a very quick gallop through the clinical high risk for psychosis CBT approach. But first of all, I'm going to start off by describing what CBT for clinical high risk for psychosis looks like in both individual and group settings. And we're going to talk about some of the strengths of this CBT approach and challenges associated with this approach and applying it to clinical high-risk populations, and also talk a little bit about some training needs and how to address these within staff teams. And before we move on, I just want to spend a couple of minutes introducing our presenters. I'm Kate Hardy. I'm a clinical psychologist at Stanford University and um, one of the faculty members of this webinar series. And I'm gonna start by providing this overview of CBTP and for the clinical high risk population and talking a little bit about some of the training that's available in this approach. I'm very excited to be able to introduce Rory Byrne, who is a um, PhD and researcher at the University of Manchester. And he's going to be presenting his research on the consumer experience of receiving CBTP. And I'm also very excited that we have Julia Lander joining us today uh, from Mount Sinai, who is going to be um, talking about both group and family-based CBT for youth at clinical high risk. So with no further ado, we will get into the, the main portion of this webinar. And there's generally a here and now focus, but we're drawing upon past experiences to explain how schema or core beliefs may have been informed and how those schema or core beliefs may influence how we see the world in the day to day. And so as we all know, CBT have been applied very broadly, anxiety, depression, many different areas, weight loss, performance, productivity and more recently has been applied to full psychosis and even more recently to individuals with clinical high risk. And this is the um, often sort of represented diagram of CBT and the interaction between thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. And any change in any one of those is going to influence change in the other area. The best way that I like to think about this is um, we know that saying things like, don't worry or cheer up doesn't work. If it did, none of us would have a job. So we can't just change our emotions at a click of a finger. But we can have control over how we respond to something behaviorally and how we think about something. And that helping somebody make changes in those areas can influence an emotional reaction to an event. Just wanting to sort of provide some background on how CBT for depression and anxiety and CBT for psychosis look very similar. When I came over to the States and started doing training in CBTP, um, I, people would say, great, I, I can do CBT for depression and anxiety, but there's no way I can do this with somebody with psychosis. And so I developed this slide to show that really the principles are very, very similar. Yes, there are adaptations. Yes, there are certainly things that you want to consider in the application of this for individuals with psychosis. There are different formulations that we want to use, but overall, we're talking about the same approach. And although we're here focusing on clinical high risk today, we can think about how does this apply across the stages of um, psychosis. So within psychosis very broadly, we're addressing attenuated symptoms. We might be testing out and developing new explanations for the experiences, addressing comorbidities, and school and peer functioning. If we see somebody transition into full psychosis, we're using CBTP to start addressing fully psychotic symptoms and developing skills around those to manage distress, maybe exploring explanatory models and beliefs about psychosis, and then reactions to having medications prescribed and, and taking medications. And then as we move further along the tra trajectory as somebody might be developing a more chronic psychosis presentation, here we may be developing and refining coping skills, addressing functional goals, 
and maybe doing more work at the underlying schema level, particularly if that work hasn't been done previously. Now, why should we be taking this approach for early psychosis? Well, we're looking at these early intervention principles that came from um, the uh, early psychosis declaration that was jointly produced by the World Health Organization and IEPA. But here we should be trying to provide interventions with demonstrated efficacy, and CBTP is evidence-based, providing services that actively partner with young people in a shared decision-making framework, and so CBTP has a client-generated problem list. We're taking a very collaborative approach, sitting on a collaborative fence, and developing a shared understanding of these experiences through formulation. And I think Rory will speak a lot more later about how that kind of collaborative approach is so essential in this work. Challenging discriminatory attitudes, and we do that a lot through normalization within CBTP. Generating optimism and expectation of positive outcomes and recovery. Um, Obviously, our CBTP approach is goal-oriented and moving towards functional recovery, not symptom reduction. And we're wanting to ensure that there's wellness planning and the development of skills and tools to support and maintain recovery. Within the um, early psychosis declaration highlighted that we should be providing, obviously, culturally sensitive services. And again, CBTP takes this individualized formulation approach, which incorporates a cultural um, awareness and understanding of the context in which people may be experiencing these um, symptoms. And then respecting the right for family and friends to participate in treatment, within CBTP, particularly working with young people, we should be including family and important support people in the treatment and wellness planning. So very, and as I said, mine is a, an overview and a quick gallop. So just talking very briefly about what training in these approaches might look like. And we, we break this into two arms generally in the early psychosis or in the, the CBTP field. So formulation-driven CBTP, which is what we're broadly talking about today, is a multi-day training for clinicians who already have some background and experience in CBT. They need some foundational knowledge. That's followed by weekly consultation. And typically, the standards are that individuals or clinicians are submitting tapes of their CBTP sessions for review using a competency measure, such as the Cognitive Therapy Scale Revised, to assess clinician competence. Ultimately, the aim is to ensure that the clinicians are trained to competence in this approach, and that's only really done through ongoing consultation and um, competency review. However, there has been more broad recognition in the field of CBTP generally that not all clinicians um, benefit from or need or want formulation-driven training, particularly if their role is more along the lines of working in a case management role. So they might be out in the community um, supporting a client to get to DMV or to get to school or to uh, go and engage in an activity. And those clinicians may be, or those case managers may really benefit from learning CBT-informed skills, but are never going to be in the role of sitting down and doing pure therapy with the client. And so what's emerged more recently has been this consideration of how to train clinicians in these CBTP-informed skills. Um, again, a multi-day training with consultation afterwards to talk about the implementation of this in a real-world setting. Um, but equally, doing fidelity review. We can't really do competence review because this is the kind of thing that, you know, you're in the middle of a basketball game and uh, somebody scores a shot and you ask them quickly, well, how did that feel? What did you think? How is that impacting what you want to do? We're not going to whip out a recorder at that stage. But instead, we might want to do fidelity around that of, did you ask these specific questions? Were you able to help the client link the thought, feeling, and behavior in that situation and then take it forward into something they might want to do in the future? A quick plug, this was a Nashbid supported um, fact sheet that focuses more on early psychosis, but certainly has a lot of principles that can be applied to clinical high risk and certainly a good resource for, I say a good resource, I wrote it, um, but something that might be helpful for folk to um, review. And we will post that on the Institute's um, website and learning platform so folks can access that at a later date. And also just to give a quick plug for the North America CBT for Psychosis Network that has evolved that I'm a co-founder of and that Yulia is involved with. Um, this is a group of CBTP clinicians and researchers across North America 
who really recognize the need to support more systematized dissemination of this approach and training. And um, we're getting to the stage now where, where I think we were either open or about to open to general membership. So feel free to check us out there. And I am going to see, do we have Rory on the line? Hello. Rory? Kate, can you hear me? I can. Hello. Manchester calling. Hi there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, thank you for joining today. us. Can you see the slides? Are you in control of the slides? Um, I had a question about that because it's a brand new format to me. So let me... I don't seem to be in control of the slides. I'm happy then to I can move them, them forward moving. for you if you just want to say next slide. Sure. I'll be as brief and with that as I can. Um, thank you so much for being here. And just for everybody, Rory is calling in from the UK where it's now quarter past six and about to be a very stormy and wet weekend, I understand. That's news to me, uh, but thank you. For, no, that, that's fine. Actually, you know what we could do with a little bit of uh, a break because it's been an unusually uh, warm summer, so that, that's fine. Okay. Fabulous. All right. Well, I'll let you get dive in, and um, I'll also give you a heads up when we're sort of running out of uh, – I'll give you a five-minute warning as well, if that's okay. For sure. Yeah, that would be helpful. Um, I am just that moment seeing a slight problem. I hope the audience can bear with me. There was a slight problem with the connection. It just seemed to cut out. I think it's just reconnecting. Okay. Uh, okay, so I can see it now. Can I just check uh, with yourself or anybody else on the call if there was any way for me to have control of the slides? Uh, both myself and you, you may find that. Absolutely. It's not that I can't kind of ask you to yeah. do so. It's just that it might be more cumbersome no for you to do so. Um, no worries, Rory. If you look at your screen and look at the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see two grayed-out arrows. Sure. And that's how you can control. Gotcha. Beautiful. All right. I have them now. Yeah. All right. Over Thank to you, you Rory. Rory. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Um, so I will, I will go ahead and I suppose deliver what, what pieces of knowledge I can that may be helpful for people. Uh, Kate, uh, I heard a little bit earlier, um, introduced me very, very kindly and in very, very gracious terms as somebody who'd offered some degree of expertise when she was doing her work back in, in back in the UK. Well, that's hugely gratifying uh, to hear because when I may have done so, I was very, very early on in my own career. Uh, that career, if you like, started, I hope that's visible to everybody there, a long, long time ago uh, in a city far, far away from, I guess, where most of you guys are. So I was in Manchester. The screenshot on screen at the moment uh, is an abstract um, from a very, very interesting, uh, an article about a very, very interesting research study that I was a part of. So I was a consumer or a patient um, in this world first clinical trial testing the delivery of CBT for CHR youth to see if that would prevent uh, the onset of, of this kind of established psychosis. It was found in that trial that that was an effective approach and it reduced the risk of transition to psychosis. So as I say, I was one of the people who was um, receiving help during that time. Fast forwarding slightly, I wrote up a kind of personal account of that experience. In the, the next screenshot you can see that that's a book. So I just have one chapter within that book and I recommend it to anybody who wants to read about the wider uh, topic of uh, risk of psychosis or established psychosis. And those include, very importantly, lived experience accounts, so personal accounts of um, the difficulties and what might be helpful in recovery. Uh, I've included also here, uh, not just gratuitously, but very importantly for me, um, another screenshot of a, a journal article abstract that was authored first and foremost by Dr. Hardy, who's on the line today. And that was one of the first, I think, in the world uh, interview studies where CHR youth were consulted and asked in depth about their experiences of accessing the kind of service that had become a little bit more standard now, but at the time was extremely new and uh, novel, rather groundbreaking, really. So kudos to Kate for having done that work very, very early on. Um, also, just a, a very, very quick snapshot to say, this kind of approach, the CBT for CHR youth, um, is then represented in the UK at a national level, uh, recognized at a, in the UK at a national level in I suppose a, a, the, the screenshot you can see here is um, a piece of news uh, that came from our national NICE guideline uh, center. So that is a, a large scale, national level, government funded um, kind of committee delivering high quality reviews of treatment approaches that might be useful or helpful for very specific uh, clinical or medical problems. And in this case, it was decided in 2013 this kind of approach that we're talking about today should be offered as a matter of uh, fairly routine practice for CHR youth. Okay, um, probably most importantly in terms of what I might be able to help 
uh, talk through today are specific personal experiences of other CHR youth that I have spoken to in my time in, in the job that I have. Uh, this first article, again, just showing a screenshot at the moment, um, was the first that I, I authored uh, with my uh, senior supervisor, Tony Morrison. Um, and this was an interview study speaking to young people who had accessed the same service Kate had earlier uh, surveyed. Um, in this study that you're, you're kind of seeing a screenshot of at the moment, there was a bit more of a specific focus on engaging with the CBT specifically and accessing the service more generally. And what those young people told us in a series of headlines were uh, that negative social attitudes associated with psychosis reduced their willingness to disclose psychological problems. And there you have a, a personal quote from somebody kind of spelling that out, that they didn't want to speak to family or friends about what they thought was unusual or what, what they thought might mean they were going mad. Um, and that, that's a very distressing um, type of experience or fear, and I can relate to it personally. So I suppose what we find is that's common in our CHR youth before they even get to help seeking. There's a huge amount of fear and worry about what it might mean if they talk about these things. Those kind of difficulties, communicating these kind of psychological distresses, did reduce, actively reduce people's ability to seek appropriate help, and that's a big problem. Um, in a slightly more positive turn of events, when people had been through this service, when they had had a positive experience of help seeking and communication, um, it did seem to be that, that talk, people's, the young people's talk about their communication of these difficulties did seem to be central to the recovery that they then were able to uh, reflect on. Okay, I'm just going to take a breather for just one second while I take a sip of water. I hope you can bear with me. I'll be real quick. I'm back in the room. Um, this next screenshot is a second interview study I've done with my, my supervisor, Tony Morrison. It's similar, but it's more specific still uh, in terms of looking at experiences of CBT for CHR youth. This interview uh, study was a small study based in a much larger trial, which was a much larger version of the trial that I myself had been involved with um, approximately 10 years prior to that. This one screenshot is just there to reflect a total of four studies of, uh, data and interview uh, kind of reflections from which I will draw when you see the following few slides. Uh, but this one I might kind of point your attention to because for me it, it marked a very, very valuable and important personal milestone in that I was returning to this subject matter to ask young people about their experiences, having been there myself. Okay, so what I've drawn out here is a kind of provisional. This isn't tested, it isn't yet peer-reviewed, re peer uh, but I think it's a reasonable, based on the evidence, reasonable um, summary model of what qualitative, that is, interview studies, pers personal feedback tells us about experiences of CBT for CHR states, what might be helpful, useful, or valued in those experiences of CBT, and, and what that might lead to. So, first of all, a chance to talk. It seem, might seem simple, it might seem basic and non-specific, but simply having that chance to talk to our young people about things they have never spoken about in many cases, or in contexts that were for the first time safe and comfortable for them, um, can I just check? I might be able to get a, a message visible to me. I'm just seeing a note that I might be speaking a bit too quietly. Yeah, if you can just speak up a wee bit, Rory, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, Perfect. So I guess what, what I'm going to speak about now, and I'll try and speak as clearly as possible, is the more important part of my input. So if anybody's missed anything I've said, I apologize. Um, but I'll, I'll try and kind of focus on, on the most important stuff from this point. So um, offering, as I said, a, a summary model of personal experiences of CBT for CHR, and this is what we find. People consistently talking about the value of simply having a chance to talk to somebody safely and comfortably in these ways was highly valued. Um, and this is a consistent across four different studies across 10 years of CBT for CHR youth. Those opportunities for safe disclosure uh, were often uh, highly valued to people and not what they feared or expected. The, the first person there is talking about a kind of catastrophic fear that they might be effectively hospitalized involuntarily if they simply talked about uh, unusual psychological experiences. Um, the normalizing and informality that people found in their experience of the CBT uh, safe space, if you like, was also um, new and not necessarily what people expected in a, in a very pleasant way. Speaking to somebody, getting those, those thoughts out, those fears out, actively talking them through is highly valued in a, in a consistent way and can help people kind of see in, in a mirror fashion, you know, reflected back to them from the therapist. This is okay. This is fine to talk about these things. In fact, it's probably the right thing to do. 
Um, also, in a kind of more active way, people will consistently tell us that talking about these things can help clarify their thinking, reduce a lot of confusion and fear that can come from simply not knowing what's going on. Getting these things out in the open, talking about them, seeing them in black and white, we can reduce a huge amount of that fear. Okay, so the next kind of uh, important summary area of people's experience with CBT uh, is around what people say about the therapeutic relationship. I'm just going to pause again another moment. I'll be as quick as possible. So, very consistently, our, our people that we speak to, our CHR people, um, reflect that. Um, actually, I'll just pause for a second and note a caveat. This isn't necessarily going to be possible everywhere, um, this, this flexibility that I'll mention, because, for example, if, if some um, excellent therapists are simply based in a clinic and can't do home visits, for example, well, there may not be a way around that. But if there ever is, it's valued highly as an option. As this young person says, uh, if, they, if the therapist hadn't been able to come to visit them in their local college, the young person simply, simply wouldn't have been able to engage with that therapy. Um, and that can be a kind of deal breaker for, for quite a few people. But again, if it's not possible, it's not possible. And I guess as a profession, we work around that. The collaboration that people experience in therapeutic relationships is also highly valued and is obviously an integral part of CBT and how it works well, a team effort, as that young person said in that second quote. The kind of beneficial relationships that people perceive with their therapist were often valuable um, in a way that these, these people didn't have otherwise in their lives. Uh, the person says that the, the therapist was the only one who gave them emotional support. Um, and finally, kind of echoing that element of support, actual practical help and, and support activities were something that people reflected back on, on where their therapists have been particularly helpful for them, visiting in hospital and so on. Um, so the process of CBT for, for CHR uh, people is, I suppose, interestingly, not something that always comes out uh, or reflected back in a huge amount of detail from the people we speak to, I guess, because they're not the professionals. They're not thinking and talking day in, day out in the way the professional CBT therapists will about change strategies and formulation and so on. So actually, the qualitative personal feedback we hear about the process, it's often very nonspecific, but we do see some key elements of um, specifically CBT practice being uh, remembered, reflected, and valued. Those include um, the kind of motivation to change that it takes to engage with active CBT, because it's not sitting on a couch, simply uh, freewheeling. Uh, thoughts. It, it's about engaging with active um, thinking processes, formulation processes, etc. And so um, our young people as often as not recognize that they have to commit themselves and their motivation uh, to this process as much as anything the therapist them, themselves is doing from that side. Now, learning to rethink things is probably the core, uh, maybe the biggest, if you like, cluster of pieces of feedback we get about what was helpful in the process of CBT, the various types of change strategies, reappraisals of distressing beliefs and so on, uh, weighing up evidence for and against. These kind of things are reflected back to us in interviews again and again in, in whatever kind of general terms. Um, and the quote there kind of describes one example of that, reappraising, I suppose, uh, a paranoid belief. The importance of activity in, in a CBT approach is also recognized consistently, uh, and especially kind of active behavioral experiments that the young, the young people or the older people themselves wouldn't necessarily do without that prompting and that structure and, and kind of safe guidance from the therapist. Homework, again, is an integral part of, of typical CBT. Um, it isn't always possible for the remember to do it. Sometimes fear is involved in stepping out of their comfort zone between sessions, but when it has been put in place and practice, it, it's often found to be very, very valuable and builds very importantly on what has been gained in each individual session and then between sessions over time. Okay, so what we would always hope is for some kind of positive outcome, some kind of positive change from, from somebody engaging with the CBT process. And very, very frequently, that's what we see. Um, so I'll just talk about some of the ways those, those changes are reflected back to us. Improved understanding, reflecting back on this kind of uh, reappraisal and rethinking things, is probably the number one positive change people talk about, just understanding things differently, understanding themselves. Uh, the first person quoted there talks about um, being able to understand what's happening and why, and it's that key question why that was, is kind of new to people frequently. Um, accepting and coping with anything that might be difficult and continues during or after therapy is something we have to accept. Uh, if a lot of people is going to go on, we, we don't have magic wands, we don't have silver bullets yet for lots, lots of the problems people are presenting with. 
what we can do, what we do do in CBT, is help them to accept and cope better. Um, and moving forward, uh, people often come away from CBT thinking uh, in more kind of positive, optimistic, active terms for themselves, seeing that uh, there might still be changes to make, there still, there still might be improvements to work on, but that they can do so and that they are in the process of doing so. Um, if somebody's able to indicate uh, a degree of time, uh, that would be helpful. I've slightly lost track of how far or how much of our time I've taken up. You've got 10 minutes, Rory. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Kate. So the next two points I'll make uh, as quickly as possible, and these are um, really untested, but from not just this body of uh, interview research, but a much larger body that I've been involved in over the years. These two next factors seem to me something important to mention or suggest uh, that the rest of you professionally think about. So are th there are those summary points, the three blue main blocks, if you like, that I've talked through, uh, and the elements of change that we, we tend to see most frequently. But what are some of the additional factors that might make a difference in somebody getting there? Well, trust, how much a person engaging with therapy is able to trust, either from the get-go, from day one, can they open up about what's most difficult for them? Or do they find that extremely difficult? Well, I guess I would find, sorry, I guess I would reflect that across my years of doing interviews with people, that does seem to be a key, um, not a deal maker or a deal breaker, but it seems to be a key moderator or mediator of how much people are uh, reflecting back positive changes and especially their engagement with the therapeutic process and the therapist, how much they trust the therapist personally and how much they trust the, the, pro, uh, the process. So I guess it's something to be mindful, perhaps the, towards the beginning of a course of therapy, do you sense there is a, a kind of active trust here with this person? If not, if you feel the client is finding it very difficult to trust and open up, then maybe that's the sort of first and most important thing to look at uh, before the rest of it will really come together um, effectively. Also, the, the level and the degree of the, the client's ability to actively participate in these processes is important to consider and potentially manage or work around if there are any particular difficulties. Now, in some cases, active participation or not could be down to somebody's personal motivation, a positive sense about CBT or a negative sense about engaging with the therapy. Sometimes it's, it's more concrete or cognitive than that. Somebody might have specific issues with memory, cognitive capacity, um, learning ability, and so on. So again, just something to consider uh, working on, perhaps towards the start of a course of therapy and see if there are important factors or difficulties there um, to help the person manage and work around. Okay, quick pause for me. As much as it's, it's hugely um, kind of, well, it's very positive for me to talk about the, the benefits of therapy and the positive aspects people reflect back to us, but it's not always plain sailing. There are difficulties for the people who engage with therapy and sometimes challenges. And these are very, very important to recognize, not just to, to respect the, the testimony we get back, but to think clinically about how to work around them because they are going to be there in your work. Um, probably first and foremost, jumping out of this from interview after interview is the difficulty of facing and reliving difficult experiences, um, this first person quoted. Um, and there, there includes a mild profanity there, which I, I have heard from uh, top, well, given top guidance that it's right to include the exact words people use, so I won't apologize for using that. Um, but yeah, sometimes it can, it can make somebody feel a bit low during a session, after a session, to have talked about things that are incredibly distressing for them that they may never have spoken about before. So I guess I would just uh, put it over to the professionals, to you guys, to say uh, that's in your hands, to be, to be mindful, bear on your training and your expertise in, in dealing with difficult disclosures of trauma or distressing content of voices or parallel beliefs and so on, uh, because those are likely to be the most difficult things for people to start with and to, to work through over time. Um, the kind of active side of uh, engaging with CBT, the work of it, is not always easy. Um, that this kind of term, no pain, no gain, was given to us verbatim from, what, from one of our interviews. Um, and the, the people do frequently realize that you do have to put the work in. Um, and yes, it can be difficult at times, but if you don't have that difficulty, if you don't, don't go through those most difficult steps, you're not going to get to the kind of green light at the end. You're not going to see a change. Um, so there is often a kind of implicit recognition that, yes, it's difficult, but that's okay. We accept that as part of therapy because that's what gets us there. That's what gets us moving forward. Um, also important to think about endings, but again, I'll just leave that with you professionals to, to kind of think about through your experience of training and expertise. 
but certainly for some people, maybe a minority, but for some people, uh, the ending of therapy can really be quite difficult and sometimes it might be a point at which um, people realize that they would have liked longer to capitalize on any gains that they would have made. So just important to think about how to maximize benefits towards the end of therapy to leave people feeling they can they can take things further on their own independently. Okay, there are additional challenges in CBT that come from across the literature, not just the CHR group. Um, I guess we don't really have time to delve into those today, but simply worth saying that they are important to pay attention to. Um, and for any specifically interested person uh, to delve into the, the, I suppose, the literature behind these, I can be contacted for any, any uh, deeper or more, more detailed references for any of these points. Um, certainly expectations about CBT is an important thing to think about, how much people at the start want to be part of it, uh, and is that something to be worked on? Like I said before, practical or personal difficulties with communication, concentration, and memory should be looked at and managed. Uh, drug or alcohol use it may, may well affect somebody's ability to turn up, it may affect their ability to remember or to kind of think straight, talk straight, etc. Um, collaboration for some people might be difficult. They might they simply might not feel the kind of therapeutic relationship is happening and so might not engage in that fully 50-50 way we would hope they would. Sexual content um, of, of different types in terms of both lived experience but also sexual content in symptomatology can be one of the most difficult things for people to talk about. It's also one of the most difficult things for therapists to ask about. So it's still a sensitive area that is being worked on through various uh, threads of research. Cultural differences, there may be reasons why people from certain backgrounds, collectivist backgrounds if you like, non-Western backgrounds, might find the, in, the kind of ostensibly individualist, individualistic approach of CBT to not really fit what it is that's going to work for them. So that can be worked around and there are culturally adapted forms of CBT as they're um, already developed and being tested further. Inequality in access, we know in the UK that black and minority ethnic individuals are less likely to be offered or delivered CBT or the kind of related family intervention. And that's something structural and that's something that we as a kind of society need to work on but in individual services can also be something worth paying attention to and individual by individual professionals can all help in, in shifting shifting that and making it uh, what it should be, which is equality. Okay, uh, there's an important question to ask here probably in my last minute or so, I think, and that is the question of could CBT make things worse? Now, we're all very, very familiar with the idea of a medication as a treatment um, coming with the risk of side effects, adverse effects. Uh, and so we are cautious or thoughtful about the idea of medicating uh, young people or people with uh, sub-threshold symptoms and so on. What about CBT? Should we be taking that for granted that it's simply a positive intervention? No, we shouldn't. We should always be thinking that anything that has the, the power and the effect to bring a positive change, in the worst of cases, could make things worse. Um, there's a, a description, or sorry, a definition that I won't read out in full, but that's the best working definition we have from psychotherapy research in terms of trying to define what a side effect would be in therapy, because it's understudied and it's still in um, its infancy, really, this research question. But from what evidence there is, and this is high quality evidence, the two references that are given there in the next line, these are meta-analyses, uh, and there were no significant differences in negative effects or withdrawal from CBT between active and control groups in clinical trials. Um, and in fact, conversely, CBT shows indications of reducing those risks of uh, adverse events in, in terms of uh, people self actively engaged in self-injury or suicidal ideation or activity and so on. So currently to date, the evidence says no, CBT is not making things worse, but it does hold the potential to do so in the worst of cases. Um, the two following points around therapeutic alliance and partial therapy come from the wider psychosis literature, which should be equally true in this, in this paradigm. Um, and that is just to summarize, we expect a good therapeutic alliance and we hope for that. Where there isn't one, for whatever reason, um, keeping a person engaged in that therapy longer and longer is more and more likely to actually be detrimental for them. Similarly, but slightly differently, um, offering only partial therapy where you never really get further than assessment or engagement um, might be detrimental rather than beneficial. So to give an, an anecdotal account of that, what if you start opening quote unquote a can of worms with somebody um, and they simply don't end up having the time or the space or the safe uh, context to work that through? Well, then you may have left somebody with a whole lot of thoughts they've long buried and so on. 
Um, so it's important to think about just how much you are asking people to open up if you don't have the time or the capacity to offer a full course of therapy in Thailand. Okay, so those summary points I probably won't list one by one. They are literally, I guess, what I've just talked through. Um, and I hope this material will just be available to everybody dialing in today so you can uh, hopefully access all of these if you want to refer back to them. Uh, but there are certainly valued aspects of CBT that we hear about frequently, very, very commonly. But there are also challenges and potential negative aspects of CBT that we must be mindful of. Again, not just to respect people's kind of well-being and, and the ethical soundness of delivering a therapy, but to make it better. You make it better by looking at um, what has not worked so well in the past. Okay, summary points again, not going to, I suppose, detail them one by one, but these are all tips I've drawn from the wider research and CHR research in particular uh, around what might be most helpful to think about in terms of engagement with these, these uh, kind of CHR youth groups. Um, and in many ways, they echo things that I've already talked through. As it's 42 minutes past the hour, I'm going to stop talking then. Hopefully, I haven't gone over too far on my time, um, and I will hope to hear an invitation around that in a moment. No, that was fantastic, Rory. You were spot on. Thank you so much and for making my job easier, which I deeply appreciate. Um, so if you don't mind staying on the line, Rory, I think we'll have some questions towards the end. Um, and do, 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 Yulia, if you are up next, can you move the slides? And um, I think 25 minutes. Yes, I can. Fantastic. Hello. Great. Uh, I am uh, happy to talk today about our group and family-based cognitive behavioral therapy for adolescents and young adults at clinical high risk for psychosis. This is an intervention that uh, our team has been developing and evaluating and now implementing uh, here in New York. I will talk about treatment model and specifically how we adapted CBT for psychosis training for family caregivers, which is a part of our treatment model. And I will also talk a little bit about implementation, a step care model for clinical high risk that we are currently uh, implementing and testing at uh, two states uh, here in New York and also Delaware. So treatment model uh, we are using and we manualized is based on uh, the research findings in what uh, contributes to uh, the development of a uh, psychosis and all uh, risk factors that are particularly important. Um, among these uh, risk factors, uh, research show that cognitive biases play an important role. Uh, for example, a tendency to jump to conclusions or a tendency to uh, personalize information instead of attributing it to other causes. Also, making, uh, making uh, not uh, helpful appraisals of difficult uh, symptoms and experiences. For example, if a person hears a voice and attributes uh, this to a devil, this is devil talking to me, that could be a very scary, which could particularly increase a distress and make these experiences worse. Uh, as well as reasoning uh, strategies, um, non-maladaptive reasoning strategies can contribute to maladaptive appraisals of experiences. And other important factors are affect regulation, regulation of emotions, isolation. When people spend more time in isolation, they don't get important feedback from other people, and that could also contribute into the formation of distressing or delusional beliefs. A family and peer environment play a very important role. We know from studies that positive family environment 
contributes to a recovery and also not being isolated, have peers who are supportive could also help with both recovery and be a protective factor against emerging psychosis. So this was a factor that we considered uh, when developing our group and family-based CBT intervention. The goal of interventions are to prevent or delay and transition to threshold psychosis by teaching youth make adaptive appraisals of psychotic-like experiences. We also uh, hope to help a youth to restore or maintain psychosocial functioning, to help them develop strategies for resilience to stress, and also enhance youth and their families' ability to communicate about difficult symptoms and experiences. As Rari was just talking about, how important it is this to be able to express themselves and to receive supportive feedback. Uh, we also wanted to facilitate positive family and peer environment and uh, facilitate use of skills learned in time limited CBT. Uh, so we aim to teach CBT skills to both young individuals uh, at clinical high risk at their, and their families. So their families can continue uh, to support them and to help them implement CBT skills at home. So this is our intervention. Uh, it has three components. Uh, there is a group uh, skill component where young individuals learn uh, CBT skills in a group. Uh, there are 15 lessons. And another very important goal of this group is to develop collaborative, supportive uh, environment. And then there is a family group where family members learn the same CBT skills that young individuals are learning. And we also teach families how to communicate uh, with uh, their relatives uh, about uh, difficult symptoms and experiences. And for that, we adapted CBT for psychosis training that we typically teach clinicians to teach it to family members. And we have individual sessions in which young individuals apply skills that they learn in a group to their personal experiences, as well as talk about any difficulties are communicating in a group or connecting with other people in a group uh, because we want to help them make these connections. Uh, this is what uh, youth and uh, family members learn during uh, 15 uh, sessions in their groups. So they get to know each other, they identify their personal goals, um, and then they learn uh, basics of CBT, they learn ABC of CBT model, they also learn to identify and correct cognitive biases, they learn about utility of beliefs, how beliefs are formed, can we change our beliefs, and they put it all together and learn how to step by step evaluate stressful uh, beliefs and stressful thoughts. And all group members learn all the skills using unusual examples, and then they work together as a group to help each other re-evaluate some of the stressful, sometimes paranoid beliefs that they have 
in order to help each other or possibly change these stressful beliefs to more adaptive one. And then there is a lot of a feedback, positive feedback they provide to each other and uh, talk about how each person contributed to the group. In individual sessions, I use um, talk about some of the concepts that we discussed in the group, clarify some of the co these concepts, also address group process and apply concepts learned in a group to their personal goals. I would like to show you some of the examples from our, our workbook to demonstrate what youth and family members are learning in the group. Um, each person would have a workbook. This is a cover of a workbook. And also we have a PowerPoint presentation as it goes along with this. So group uh, looks like a classroom environment. And each time there is a new lesson learned. They uh, have various fun exercises to get to know each other. So this is one of them. And they identify their goals for a group. They identify some suspicious or stressful beliefs that are interfering with their goals. And also, they review together these goals to see what goals do they have in common. Here is some example of uh, adolescence goals. Uh, to gain techniques that help me ignore the paranoid thoughts. To be able to get through this dark storm that I've been facing for the past year and to get my life back. And my goal is to be the social butterfly I used to be. As you can see, all these goals are around doing better, connecting with people, having friends. And here are some examples of the family member's goal. Uh, to have more positive interactions with my daughter, to learn how to keep calm in the face of children's anxiety, to learn how to approach difficult subjects, voices, figuring out what is reality and what is imagined. Uh, here is another example that demonstrates how people learn about cognitive biases. Um, we will give an, a definition of what this cognitive bias is, provide an example, and then a series of exercises where youth and family members can practice of making uh, a judgment uh, without personalizing and with uh, using personalization bias. So Mary came back home and her window was broken. She did take it personally. What may she might be thinking? Uh, and then if she didn't take it personally, what she might be thinking? Here's another example uh, to demonstrate how we uh, teach our uh, youth and family members come up with multiple explanations for various events. Mary came back home and her window was broken. What could have happened? So they uh, practice to uh, come up with multiple explanations for experiences. Uh, they also learn ABC model of CBT uh, using also neutral examples. Here is again our character in a workbook. Her name is Mary. And uh, she saw two women passing by and they were laughing. And Mary thought they are laughing at me. Uh, we built ABC model of uh, Mary's belief. And we also learn at uh, thinking errors that Mary has. For example, here, Mary tends to personalize, thinking that whatever is happening relates to her. 
our youth and family members also learn how to re-evaluate beliefs step by step, and we have handouts and exercise for each of these steps. Family members, in addition to learning CBT skills, learn how to communicate with youth about difficult symptoms and experiences. What to say, for example, if your child comes home and says, I hear a voice and I think this is some a scary ghost talking to me. Uh, so we have multiple scenarios where family members can practice uh, skills that we teach them. And we have another manual uh, called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Skills for Families, where we teach people 16 skills that we adapted uh, from our CBT for psychosis training for clinicians. Uh, they learn recognize, identify, and state emotions, and normalize experiences, normalize cognitive processes, uh, they learn to encourage youth come up with alternative explanation for their experiences, etc. So we have 16 skills. And we provide them an example of how to use this skill correctly and how not to use it. Here are some examples. And um, the whole program takes 30 weeks. We have very encouraging results from our uh, randomized control trial, and we are currently implementing this intervention in uh, three states. And, and I wanted to uh, say how grateful we are to SAMHSA who uh, funded us uh, to do this work. I just want to give one example of a prospect study. So this is one of the SAMHSA funded uh, study uh, preventing of uh, symptoms and psychosis through education and cognitive therapy. Prospect, a step care model for clinical high risk. So this is a study uh, happening here in New York. We implemented this intervention at two sites in the Institute of Family Health. And as a step one, we're using low intensity psychoeducation and introductory CBT, three sessions of CBT for youth and families. And as a step two, we are using group and family-based ICBT interventions that I just described. And uh, we are very closely linked to coordinated specialty care on Drug New York uh, that provides treatment for youth uh, who are experiencing their first psychotic episode. So they refer uh, individuals to us and we can refer to them if somebody develops psychosis. Just a couple of words about training. We provide uh, an intensive training in uh, this intervention, which consists of 42 hours of didactics where we teach clinicians about CBTP and in addition uh, teach clinicians our group and family-based CBT model. We also have practicum where clinicians have an opportunity to practice these skills with a simulated patient actor. And we follow training by a weekly group of phone supervision. We have a wonderful team. I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you for our team uh, and also thank everybody um, here and to see if people have questions.
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Julia, and thanks to both you and Rory for doing such a great job of getting through so much information um, in so little time. Quite frankly, each of those presentations could have been a webinar in and of itself, and we have time for questions, and thanks to you all for beginning to submit those. Um, so just looking back up the list of questions, which now I apparently can't go back up, that's annoying. Um, there was a question regarding the, the, the Therapeutic Alliance and the use of different measures for that. And Rory or Yulia, I don't know if either of you have um, thoughts. I know Rory, you typed some in the presenter chat, but do either of you have thoughts on that for the audience? So, so we've been using a working alliance inventory, and we've also been using group cohesiveness scale because our intervention is group intervention, and we're also finding this this a very uh, important uh, characteristics we wanted to know about this. We also used a therapeutic of factors scale to see which factors are most important uh, as perceived by youth and families. We're happy to send you those uh, if you email us. Great. Thank you. Yes, it looks like we can get those. That's fabulous. And um, another question regarding um, the the use of the inclusion of individuals with lived experience and those um, in the role of being of peer support within this clinical high risk stage, both within CBTP individual and group. I don't know if either of you have thoughts on that. So we actually developed a mentorship program. We're still in the process of developing it. And uh, some of these mentors graduated from our program, and those are young individuals who are now helping other individuals at clinical high risk. We also have community advisory board where we invited uh, people with uh, lived experiences and parents with lived experiences to join and to help us in first developing and implementing this intervention. Brilliant, thank you. And Rory, did that come up at all in your research about um, the inclusion of individuals with lived experience in the treatment aspect? Um, so I've, I've only just redialed in. I may have missed the very, very first part of that question, but take the point you've just asked. Uh, do you mean uh, I mean individuals got CHR experience being yeah. part of a kind of therapy team or, or a peer peer worker type? Thing? Yeah, exactly. Peer work or lived experience of CHR. Um, not as such. I mean, I know from personal experience, I suppose I, I meet some people, a small number of people who've been through a CHR experience, who've gone on to have some involvement in research. Not typically at the delivery end, although we are working in our department at the moment more and more on uh, peer support. So certainly a CHR paradigm uh, group of peer workers might be something we see in the future. But I also, I guess, am fairly familiar with the service landscape across the UK, and I would say no. Not at the moment. I think it's becoming relatively typical um, for peer workers uh, to be part of the workforce now in early intervention for psychosis services. But those, I suppose, bear that important distinction that those are people who've, who've crossed that threshold, if you like, um, and have a psychosis-specific service offered to them, and then they may, when, uh, may want to feed back into and give back to, and that's when they might become peer workers playing a part in the therapeutic approach, but not CHR specific. And I think there's some important reasons why we should be careful about that. Um, but I'll stop talking there. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And I'll just say anecdotally, and in, in a not very formalized sense, I know when I've seen clients there as well, Rory, a couple of clients that we did some joint therapy with, it was really beneficial to have you in the room. So, yeah, it's definitely, well, definitely ways forward to think about this. Yeah, I, and that's usually, um, it's really nice to hear that, and I remember exactly what you're talking about. Um, I suppose in, in practice, it's, it's not an option or it's not a capacity that that many services are going to have. But also, I think uh, an important consideration is, is the possibility of, so CHR people, I suppose, don't typically have as uh, long-standing or as usually extreme and experienced service involvement one way or the other um, as people who kind of cross that threshold into psychosis. 
and I suppose there's a consideration and a desire in services to not involve people with CHR uh, experiences any more than they want to be involved. And I think for somebody to become involved potentially as part of the workforce, if they then have to, to wear a label, if you like, on their work ID badge, which, which I kind of have done for years, well, the risk that comes with the risk of people becoming stigmatized with, with a label or a term or an idea that while actually going through the service and receiving that help, they may never have had. You know, we've got very, very non-specific ways of talking about things with RCHU here that may or may not ever include terms like psychosis or um, potential schizophrenia in the future. So having somebody potentially become involved in the workforce in that way includes the possibility of, of maybe harmful effects of labeling and so on. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's a, such, like, I really appreciate you bringing that up and such an important point to consider. And I think also, interestingly, from my perspective, a cultural point where when I was working in Manchester in the UK, we would not use the term clinical high risk for psychosis or the term psychosis unless the service user used that language first. Whereas here in the US, more broadly, um, people are using at risk for psychosis with service users. So it's, it's an interesting, it's just a very broad, interesting discussion point and one I think we will continue to, to, to think about. Yeah. Um, there's a several questions related to the workbook that you mentioned, Julia, and its availability, and I don't know if you're able to speak to that at all. Uh, sure. So yes, we have several uh, workbooks, and we typically um, license it and when people complete as a training of how to deliver this intervention. And um, if anybody is interested in future training and possibly trying to implement this intervention, we would be delighted to work with you. Please just contact us. And that gets to the training question as well, which is fantastic. So Yulia's information and Rory's information are at the end of the slides. Here we are. Actually, Rory, your information is not, but we can certainly put that on the presenter chat or on the chat there. Um, and feel free, both presenters and myself, um, to contact, to ask questions, to ask questions about training. Um, Yulia certainly has a very comprehensive training um, program there are other training options available in CBTP for CHR as well that we can discuss. And a couple of books that I just wanted to bring people uh, attention to is CBT for those at risk of a first episode of psychosis, written by Mark van der Gaag, um, and the group in the Netherlands. So very, very experienced team um, around clinical high risk. And then the early detection and cognitive therapy for people at high risk of developing psychosis. It's a very catchy title, but that's written by Paul French and Anthony Morrison. And you've heard Rory reference Tony Morrison already. And again, very, very experienced group working in this, this area. So two nice sort of clinical manuals that people, I would certainly recommend to individuals. Um, there's, let me see, some more questions here. Du, 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 du. I, I'm curious from both of your perspectives about group versus individual approaches. Um, so, um, so Rory, are group models being utilized in the UK or is it predominantly individual work? And then a second part of that question to Yulia is, do we have any data on the effectiveness of group versus individual? So firstly, from the UK, uh, very, very broadly speaking, um, it's individual CBT that's offered for the CHR group in terms of statutory NHS services. There may be things slightly off the grid that are happening uh, in group ways. Um, but I think two important things I'd mention about that, um, well, actually, just, just one most important thing, and that's about the, the person's preference. And what I do here in interviews um, where the topic has ever come up, where an, a preference is ever expressed, it's about that individual space. That doesn't mean um, people who kind of have a CHR state wouldn't like to be in a group or might not get something from it, but in terms of a first preference, that will most frequently by a country mile be for an individual space to be offered first, um, and then individual by individual, if it was possible, and if the offer was, was could be delivered, quite a few might then take up experience in a group and sharing things in that group fashion. 
Um, but in terms of that first preference, that would be individual and in reality, in terms of what's actually available, that's exactly what it looks like as well. And, and Yulia? So we have been specifically focusing on developing and evaluating a combined intervention, group plus individual, as we saw that individual is very, very important, but the group can add an important value. Uh, people can learn skills in a group and can be interactive. It could provide support. Uh, it could normalize uh, people's experiences, and plus people can observe each other and each other beliefs and sometimes get insight about their own uh, beliefs, uh, just learning and listening to others. And then we also we did qualitative interview asking people about the experience in a group versus individual therapy and whether they would like to change something. And it seems that people really value both in a bit different way. Um, group is important uh, to connect with others, and it's also a fast way of learning the skills in a group format. So it kind of speeds up a little bit learning of CBT, but then they can personalize uh, things in individual therapy and also speak about experiences that they might not be comfortable speaking in a group. Uh, to my knowledge, there is currently no study yet comparing individual and a group intervention or uh, a combined intervention. And this is actually something we're very interested in doing and we're planning uh, such a project at, at right now. Right, that's, um, I'm very excited to hear the outcome of that, Yuli. That'd be wonderful. Um, a question for you both, and, and I love this question because I can whisper on about this forever, but um, what is, or tell me about this Colombo process. So maybe from both of your perspectives, what is the Colombo approach in questioning in CBTP? Um, I'm going to speak up and just hand that directly over to Yulia. Um, so I'm not a practicing clinician myself. I kind of, I get the question, but I think somebody else might uh, answer it more effectively than myself. So happy to talk about Columba. So Columba is a television uh, detector. Uh, people might know him as people might know Sherlock Holmes. So Columba has a very different style from Sherlock Holmes. If Sherlock Holmes is a little bit like his accusatory style, Columba is very gentle. And Columba usually blames himself or not totally uh, understanding what was going on and asking very detailed questions to gather information about uh, what happened to understand uh, people's experiences. And his uh, favorite uh, phrase is, please help me understand. And so Columbia approach we typically recommend uh, to take to clinicians and also to family members. So it's a combination of very gentle uh, curiosity and at the same time asking questions to get the detail of experiences. For example, experience of uh, hearing a voice and what is this voice saying? And uh, then doing it in a way uh, that uh, is not um, that the person feels comfortable and uh, rather blaming themselves for uh, not understanding or misunderstanding something, uh, kind of taking responsibility for that. Thanks, Julia. And I'll just add to that as well that this really also gets at what I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, which is this idea of sitting on the collaborative fence. So in order to be able to engage in that style of questioning, that very gentle, exploratory, really curious approach um, requires us to sort of take this position on this fence of being really open to lots of different possibilities, being open to exploring, really modeling that to the individual in the hope that they'll join us on that fence and explore other possibilities. So the questioning technique that we use within CBTP really is so truly essential, in many ways more so than the actual specific skills we teach, is the, the process that we use to get to the skill teaching with some formulation in the middle. 
Um, there's a lovely question here as well about suggestions for those that work in short-term crisis hospitals and someone has had their first break, session time is limited. And, and I'm just going to jump on that one and then feel free, Yulia and Rory, to respond as well. But in this situation, I think we're going to be doing less um, of a sort of in-depth formulation-driven CBTP. I think here groups may be helpful depending on the acuity of symptoms. But I also think that training staff in these CBTP-informed skills um, and being able to, I've heard it described as sort of apply them ninja style. So, you know, you might be having a, a joining and befriending session with a person, and then as the opportunity arises, implement some CBT-informed skills that the clinicians on the unit have been trained in um, can be really high yield. And I don't know, Yulia, Rory, if you've got anything to add to that. Uh, Rory here again. I, again, I would pass it across to you, I guess. Either or both of you um, as uh, uh, clinicians, probably not something I can uh, most expertly speak about. Uh, I can only add that we piloted, we developed and piloted a very brief group uh, intervention, one session intervention, ABC of CBT for stressful thoughts and voices, and we run it on inpatient uh, unit, short term, uh, usually patients with acute psychotic uh, disorders would be hospitalized there. Uh, with some success, uh, we learned that patients were able to grasp uh, the skills, uh, the CBT model, uh, they felt understood, the experience were normalized, um, and so there is a place for a CBT even during a short intervention. And another possibly important um, task that therapists uh, could do during a short uh, term uh, stay could be start putting together a formulation uh, for uh, the patient and then it can be followed up on outpatient basis. Brilliant. Thanks, Julia. And Rory, a question here for you about um, what might be considered detrimental about partial therapy. Um, I think that's a kind of, it, it's a fairly untested um, research finding, but it was a, a, an important and a high quality research finding because of the, the trial it came from. Um, I'm not exactly sure there was an answer to that, even in the, the piece of research or the trial it came from. I think it was just a statistical association that was found. I think this, this came from a secondary analysis um, of a trial that Richard Bentor, Sean Lewis, Graham Dunn were involved in here in the UK, and those are uh, leading researchers in uh, kind of psychosis treatments. And like I said, yeah, there was a secondary analysis that just found after the fact that while therapists had done a good job at keeping people engaged in uh, CBT over time, when the researchers dug into the data of what was going on in those CBT sessions, they found that those, um, I suppose, as rated by therapists who hadn't moved beyond this fairly innocuous engagement stage but had stayed involved with therapy, there was actually, for those individuals, the kind of worsening or deterioration um, in their uh, scores, their well-being scores, whether that was the PANS outcome measure or the CIRAX or something like that. I think I, I gave a very, very brief anecdote before to, to I suppose, give my opinion of what might be happening there. Is if you are somebody who attends a therapy and you get this rare and valued opportunity to open up perhaps for the first time about difficult things, but you're, you're not exactly sure how or what to start with, well, you can, quote, unquote, open a can of worms start talking about things, start thinking about things that you hadn't done so before that are very, very difficult to contemplate and especially difficult to, to hear yourself say out loud, if then for any number of personal, practical or motivation reason, uh, reasons, you aren't then able to commit to or able to attend a longer course of therapy to work through those things. Um, well, then you might just see symptoms worsening. You might see your mood or your, your kind of rumination about those most difficult aspects of your life uh, amplified and continuing at a greater rate than they were before. So summarizing that uh, long answer, I don't think we know yet. It's just that it was, it was a reliable statistic uh, finding from a high quality piece of research. So it was worth reflecting as there are very, very few equally high quality um, research findings about negative effects, and that's just one of them. 
Yeah, and I, I've, what I've always taken from that finding was the critical importance of being able to um, engage in befriending and development of that therapeutic rapport before going into um, therapy, uh, so you know, not shortchanging that work up front, which I think that later study of the Therapeutic Alliance really demonstrated as well, which is great. Mm. Um, and then there's a question about evidence of certain skills being more effective with specific populations, i.e. veterans, LGBTQ, et cetera. I don't know if either of you can speak to that. Yulia, do you want to mention anything there? Uh, in the specific, uh, I'm just not sure if I understood the question very well. So specific skills. Uh, Kate, how did you understand the question? Um, um, so if we, if we, uh, I'm reading it as, do we know what works for whom with this approach yet? So is there a specific skill that's going to work better with a veteran population versus an LGBTQ population? Okay. Uh, well, so we know a little bit about uh, some factors that uh, would make a CBT um, more likely to work in, with a particular individual. For example, we know from um, some studies, I believe Philippa Gerritz's study, that if a person has a little bit like a chunk of insight uh, and can consider an alternative possibility, uh, that's a good uh, predictor that CBT uh, might work well uh, in this individual. Um, in terms of cultural groups or um, different ages, I also know that the earlier we intervene, uh, the better. So the probably younger people are, and with uh, less duration of untreated illness, the more likely that intervention will work. That's why we are trying now to identify uh, people with uh, symptoms earlier and provide them with helpful intervention. So I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Leah. Um, I know, Rory, you're going to have to jump off in just a second. So I just wanted to, before you do, thank you so much for your time and being with us on a Thursday evening, your time. So thank you so much. It's a real pleasure, Kate. Thank you very much for involving me. Um, I've just typed out really quickly uh, a quick question. Um, I suppose on the on the well, I know the question being, um, I may have misscheduled my attendance here. I didn't realise that there would be um, a kind of verbal question and answer. So forgive me. I haven't attended a seminar in this format before. Um, I was just going to answer something very very briefly. I think I saw another. Yeah, there was a previous question that came up. You perhaps haven't got to yet. And there was a question around potentially tailoring or adapting CBT approaches for the younger age group. That might be 10, 13, 14 year olds. Um, I probably am not the most expert to speak to that question, except the most recent study I've been involved in, interview study, has included the youngest age group we've worked with, which goes has gone down to 14 years old. Um, and I think my memory of what the therapists in that trial were telling me about what might have been happening in therapy differently for the youngest age group. Um, was, was uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Kate or Yuli. It wasn't anything particularly radical. It wasn't anything sharply different from a slightly older age group. It was just about um, case by case, uh, so case by case changes or adaptations. Um, so, for example, the very most articulate, the very most cognitively capable 14-year-old is going to engage with the exact same therapy approach as somebody who's 17 or 18 who is struggling in some of those domains, who might not have the same language capacity or memory ability for some reason. So I think it was actually the difference between the kind of age group clusters was less about the age itself as if it's a thing, mental age and uh, cognitive age, memory age. So it was a very, very individual case by case thing. Uh, Kate or Yulia, that may ring true or that may be uh, totally wrong. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree, and I think um, we, we have very effective CBT protocols for um, young children that we can also learn from, 
and it's about really individualizing and ensuring that the materials that we're using are at the correct developmental age, um, which is obviously it can often be different from the chronological age of the individual. And to me, that's always why I love CBT, because we can work either cognitively or behaviorally or a combination of the two, which gives us some flexibility. I'm just watching the time, and I'm, I'm aware we're sort of getting towards the end of the time, and Tamara's done a really good job of reminding me that we have our learning management platform as well as places to post any of the questions that we didn't get a chance to get to today. And Yulia, Rory, I'm hoping that you'd be okay with us reaching out to you to answer any of those questions that are specific to what you guys have been doing if they get posted on the platform, and basically just continue in this conversation. Um, also, just to, um, so we talked a little bit about training. I talked a little bit about training. Um, Yulia has um, training models available through um, the work that she's doing. There um, are others in the U.S. that are offering CBTP training, but feel free to reach out to me and I can direct you, um, including myself and others here at Stanford, both CBTP and CH uh, for early psychosis and CHR. Um, I just want to take the time to say thank you so much to both Yulia and Rory and to everybody for supporting this and for Tiara for doing some very fast, last minute, behind the scenes work to make everything happen and all the presenters to be on at the right time. So thank you everybody and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you. Thank bye. You bye, Yulia. Bye.